as mentioned, I'm, I'm Pete Fishman. I go by Fish. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Mozart Data. Uh, we're the easiest way to spin up a modern data stack. So I'm always happy to chat data and analytics with anyone. Um, this talk, however, is going to be mostly focused around building a company. So last weekend, uh, my company, Mozart Data, turned two years old. So I'm going to talk about some of the trade-offs in that journey and, and how we've thought about it and some general advice around a variety of things, including product and fundraising and, of course, data. So by background, I'm an economist. So unsurprisingly, um, I think startups are all about economics. And it's all about the trade-off that you're making, where you're foregoing a benefit or an opportunity um, to ultimately gain something. And that trade-off um, is a real challenge that all startups face. All startups are essentially resource, resource constrained, whether that's in people, whether that's in dollars, um, and they have to figure out a solution to that constraint. So I'm going to talk about kind of my main solution to the constraint of uh, uh, resources, which tends to be the Pareto principle. So in most things, you find basically a concave return on your efforts. And what what uh, you know a sort of fun fact is that many things have this 80-20 uh, principle, which basically means that 20% of the effort yields 80% of the results. So you really want to focus on the red areas. You really want to focus on those domains where you can put in a marginal amount of effort and get a big result from it. And that's effectively how startups operate and how startups you know, can compete with these giant companies. So um, in 20, graduated from Y Combinator and I wanted to you know, sort of share some of the sort of standard lessons from YC that I think um, generally apply, but actually relate really closely to this Pareto principle. So one is make something people want. So focus on effectively, uh, you know, the efforts that are uh, directed, learn and understand what people want and then focus your efforts towards it. Stay focused. That means basically deploy the folks building your product on those sort of 80-20 features. Um, keep expenses low, effectively 80-20 your cash, um, measure growth, and I'm obviously going to talk a little bit about how to think about data and data trade-offs, and then last, know how to be default alive, which is a Y Combinator term from Paul Graham. Um, it basically means that, you know, if your startup kept going with its current revenue growth and kept going with its expenses, is it going to out, you know, is the money that you've raised uh, going to outlive the burn? Um, when you are no longer sort of default dead, you can work on more strategic projects. You can sort of eat into the sort of uh, the 20% the that might have some real long run return. But when you're default uh, not alive, you really need to focus on those uh, opportunities that have the highest uh, return so that you can really race towards being um, a viable startup. Um, and what viability ultimately looks like is getting to product market fit. Now, um, some people describe product market fit as a variety of steps. So, you know, you've got some sort of moments where you're validating an idea, you then sort of figure out how to scale that idea and grow. And it looks maybe linear or even exponential. Um, that has not been my experience and certainly not, you know, Paul Graham's description of the experience of starting a company. In reality, it looks more like the sort of bottom right, where um, results are, you know, these beautiful curves of your growth are never how it happens. Um, in fact, it's often these zigzag curves where sometimes, you know, your product, your your progress is not just nonlinear, but uh, almost negative and your, your emotions sort of follow that. So this is a tough journey and you're in a race to product market fit. And my best advice is to go lean, which is basically this learn, build, measure framework. Um, the lean startup is a Eric Reese idea. And, and the idea is that you, you know, talk to customers, learn something, you build sort of an MVP of that, you measure sort of its efficacy, and then you sort of go and go back to the drawing board. Now, um, in terms of building an MVP, we're all very familiar with sort of the website on the bottom left. So the website on the bottom left is a beautifully designed, uh, incredibly efficient, 
uh, you know, marketplace, Airbnb. But Airbnb didn't start as Airbnb, it started as Airbed and Breakfast, um, which, which does not look like an incredibly uh, beautiful and efficient um, marketplace. They iterated towards that. Their sort of core offering was um, making sort of a bed available. And then from there, they've been able to grow into obviously the behemoth that they are today. Uh, one of the key elements of um, any company is sort of, you know, measuring itself. Um, I love uh, Pearson's law, which says that which is measured improves. Um, a second part of Pearson's law is that which is measured and reported improves exponentially. So if understanding what your 80-20 projects are, um, you know, helps you, you're able to grow sort of exponentially from there. If you know kind of what you know what you're measuring and you're able to sort of take take a barometer at different points in order to sort of measure yourself you want to implement something like uh you know a modern data stack or a data pipeline um, and this is a nice picture from emergence of sort of the modern data stack and if you're an enterprise this is not challenging whatsoever you pick your favorites from each of the categories and you stitch together a really impressive sort of set of infrastructure that's going to make you know ingesting data and then turning it into useful insights easy. Um, in practice, that's not what a startup can do. A startup doesn't have time. A startup needs a simplified data pipeline. It needs tools that are generating their data. It needs extract into a cloud data warehouse. It needs to transform that data and it ultimately needs to visualize that data downstream. Um, so, you know, piecing it together is certainly something that you can do, but my argument is always focus on your expertise. So, you know, when I think about sort of building tools internally versus buying these tools, um, what you really want is the easy button and you want to not be distracted from your main task. So that's kind of what Mozart's data's vision is, which is think about your sources, think about your uses, and we'll basically handle everything in between. Um, again, measurement here is such a key part of your product iteration. Okay. So I now want to sort of um, take a step back and talk about some of the things that we've accomplished in the last two years. Um, and one of the big ones was fundraising. So when you do Y Combinator, um, they they insist that you have an A plan, a B plan, and a C plan. And what the A plan is, is figure out what's the least amount of money that you could raise in order to essentially get to an MVP. What the B plan is, is what, what is basically the strategy that, that you should have in place? Um, you know, what, what is it that you need? What is it that, you know, that the funding will give you? And then a C plan is to, you know, basically think if, you know, the market is flush or if, you know, your startup is sort of gaining more traction, um, both with customers and investors uh, than you had initially planned, it's often okay to sort of, um, you know, expand the round accordingly. Um, so one of my best pieces of fundraising advice basically mimics YCs, which is to have sort of different sort of fundraising targets and goals so that you can frequently, frequently be sort of on track or on target. Next, um, one of the things that you know, we found when we were in YC was that um, demo day was predominantly a deadline more than it was um, the ability to showcase ourselves in front of hundreds of investors. So in order to essentially move the ball forward, you often need some sort of either official or artificial deadline. The deadlines basically bring about the urgency of the investors and your own urgency in terms of achieving certain milestones. So often kind of you worry about sort of around getting strung along as you wait for a lead to, to get in as much information as possible to decide, but actually having these sort of um, deadlines that you set both for yourself and the investors really um, help you determine who's actually interested in you versus who is, you know, maybe partially interested in you. 
and sort of piggybacking off of deadlines and off of uh, a, an A, B, and C plan, you want to be cool. Um, and by that, I mean, you want to be the club where there's a line around the door, even if there's nothing going on inside of the club. You know, so, um, you know, very often you'll see like a line around the door. And you're like, oh, wow, I wonder what's going on inside that club. And maybe there's actually nobody inside the club. You know, there's, there's not windows here. There's like a brick wall. So um, sort of having that sort of image of, you know, having a sort of more constrained round sort of, again, generates that urgency. And again, one of my themes here, in addition to the Pareto principle, is generate urgency. So after you raise money, um, and we were able uh, to raise money uh, after demo day, um, you want to build a team. So um, most people, when they think about building a team, and when you talk to founders about their startup, they think about building the dream team. So the dream team is uh, a famous basketball team from the early 90s. It was basically made up of all Hall of Famers. Um, they're all incredible players. And, you know, you, you, you know, you often think, okay, I want to pluck, you know, Larry Bird or Magic Johnson from, you know, this fancy company that I, you know, maybe we work together at and then, you know, bring them on board and, uh, you know, get the band back together. Or they've got an incredible resume with a great background of schools and jobs. Um, you know, maybe I want to bring in that player. Um, I would argue that actually it's exactly the opposite. So you don't want the 1992 uh, Olympic basketball team. You want the 1984 Olympic basketball team. On the right is the 1984 Olympic basketball team. Now, one thing to note is that there are three players that were on both of these teams. So Patrick Ewing, Chris Mullen, if you're a Golden State Warriors fan, I'm from the Bay Area, and uh, the person in the middle, Michael Jordan. And these were before they were household names. So when they played in 1984, um, they were amateur players. So I think one of the things that's, again, ties back to the Pareto principle and the constraints of startups is that you often have to look for effectively the Michael Jordans before they become Air Jordan. So you have to find essentially um, folks that maybe are, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, maybe slightly less experienced or whether it's underappreciated or maybe, um, you know, they're, they're lacking in some skill that you think you can train them up in. Typically, building a team at a startup is not about making a collection of these sort of dream teamers. Instead, it's all about sort of finding um, the players that will ultimately uh, become sort of uh, legends of the game. And almost all of the really monumental startups end up having an incredibly talented and gifted early team that all have grown into, you know, larger roles. So uh, my next piece of advice is uh, be a two marshmallow founder. So um, what that means in, in, in practice is there's a, you know, we're in San Mateo, just a few miles south of us is uh, Stanford University. And in the 70s, they ran an experiment where they asked little children um, to receive an award. And the, the reward was uh, a marshmallow. And they told the children that uh, it, they could eat the marshmallow or they could leave it for 15 minutes. And at the end of those 15 minutes, a second marshmallow would be put there and then you could enjoy two marshmallows, which generally is twice as good. Um, you know, there's this tension between wanting immediate gratification and, you know, sort of wanting something that's going to pay huge dividends in the long run. So when you're a startup, you often don't have the luxury of, you know, many quarters to figure it out. You have to figure something out in short order so that you can get um, the funding and again, be default alive. Um, the, the flip is you also don't want to be making short run oriented trade offs that ultimately are extremely costly to your business. So, you know, one of my other pieces of startup advice is to be a two marshmallow founder. So uh, I think that covers uh, a lot of what I've sort of learned over the last two years and some of my favorite pieces of advice from 
Y Combinator and my experiences uh, co-founding and running uh, a company and fundraising. Um, one of the things that I, I, you know, I did like this this quote, especially as it relates to startup grind. It's definitely not a sprint; it's a marathon. Um, be patient and uh, grind hard. So, um, with that, I think I will turn to um, see if there are, uh, you know, questions um, from the audience that we can either, you know, dive back into um, anything around. I wanted to, you know, effectively make this mostly a conversation between uh, myself and, and other founders that are sort of interested in this journey. Okay, well, the questions are still coming. Thank you so, so much for that. I think one of the, the questions I always say is, you know, like YC, Y Combinator is one of the most if not the most preeminent accelerator out there, what top tip to founders um, of how to get into YC? So, um, so YC, um, you know, again, so much of uh, YC's advice and so much of YC's uh, philosophy is all public domain knowledge. So you don't have to have gone through YC to know this. You don't have to uh, know a YC founder, though anybody should feel free uh, to reach out to me, feed at mozartdata.com, um, to ask that type of advice. Um, it's all sort of available very much publicly. And then also YC does offer, beyond its accelerator, it does offer a startup school that, that tends to instill some of these philosophies. Um, the biggest thing that I would say is is truly adhering to Jessica Livingston's advice, which is um, which is to say, um, you know, talk to customers, you know, build, make something people want, um, and you know that involves discovering what people want, and very often founders validate that in their own head. So actually, when you know I start, you know, I, I made this sort of novice mistake myself. When I started uh, my company, um, I had a vision for uh, the data buyer at, at a company. And that vision was all about looking in the mirror. So I was building for myself. Um, I, I had been the head of analytics at a number of really um, great late stage startups and, and saw those teams grow and built out data infrastructure, data stacks. And I figured I know exactly what uh, the startup data person wants and needs. Um, in practice, I was I was quite wrong, and it's been sort of an iterative challenge uh, to get to a place where the value prop resonates with someone who's not me. So you know, I'm someone very familiar with data terms. I live, breathe, eat, sleep uh, data, and I know that we only briefly covered data, you know, in this talk. And I'm happy to talk about how. Uh, to get started on on some data infrastructure and some of the challenges there, but I was building for me, and this is a typical founder problem. So when you think about sort of applying to YC, do your homework, talk to, and you know, YC wants to back. You know now you know the the batch sizes are very large, and they um, you know they're able. You know we were part of the first virtual batch, so you can really be anywhere in the world, and what they're looking for is somebody that you know is obviously technically sound and and has a perspective and an opinion, um, but also somebody that's validated that opinion by talking to people, and that's the cheapest, easiest, and again, sort of ties really closely to the lean startup approach that I had mentioned earlier. Yeah, no, love that. Thank you. Very, very useful advice there. Mm -hmm. Now you spoke of. I'm a big basketball fan. Love Michael Jordan. Um, love the Jordan brand. You mentioned the dream team. One of the questions we've got here from Abdel Rahman is, you know, by your in your presentation, you mentioned almost higher, right? But when you are building a startup and you want to get the greatest possibility of it being successful, how would you go about hiring tech talent? like the tech team, would you give them exercise? 
who's gonna who's more interested in in stock options and equity versus a high salary like what are the things early and obviously later we know it's definitely different when you raise <coughs> funding but certainly in the early days what would you look for when hiring that kind of tech talent um so th there's sort of many pieces of advice i have around hiring so obviously um you know your startup is basically a collection of people um, the ideas are a dime a dozen, the execution is everything, and the people that execute are um, the in-house talent. So um, it's, it's unambiguous that so much of your startup success is going to depend on um, you know, great, uh, you know, uh, great technical talent and great ability to um, you know, build things and iterate quickly, sort of building off of this sort of 80-20 idea. Um, the, the pieces of advice that I have, and they're sort of cliche, but I do believe them and I've sort of adhered to them in my own sort of hiring approaches. One is that, you know, I, I do think you have to look at yourself in the mirror and realize that it is very hard. So, you know, you have, you know, places like Amazon, Google, Fang companies that basically can, can offer sort of almost obscene salaries, to technical talent, because they do get that leverage from that, from that skill set. So, um, you know, you want to offer something different, right? I think like this is sort of this is where the dream team thesis comes in, um, sort of trying to compete with one of those on your compensation is is at best naive, or at worst, it's going to put you out of business. Um, uh, when you when you think about sort of the ways that you can compete, you can offer much greater um, agency, you can offer much greater learnings, you can a much, uh, you know, better working environment and typically early hires dictate kind of that company culture. So these are the things that you can directly offer. And then you can, of course, sweeten the pot with, um, being generous with equity. Uh, you know, it, it's not really, um, you know, I, it's sort of not optimal to have the owners of the company be the founders and the venture capitalists. Um, you want people with as much skin in the game as possible because it helps a number of elements of alignment, right? It's not just, um, you know, one of the ways that you get people to be aligned around your vision or around the most important challenges of the company, the sort of 80-20 challenges of the company is that you, you know, you get up and you give an impassioned argument about why this is one of the most important challenges. Um, in practice, the folks that are uh, most, you know, incentive aligned, as in their compensation, a huge component of it, they see as their their ownership in the company or their equity, um, is a, is a real draw. Often there are huge advantages to owning equity, uh, you know, from uh, you know, basically from a, a tax perspective. So you know, that's a really efficient way of giving people skin in the game. Um, so I'm often, you know, an, an advocate of being generous um, uh, on that front. Uh, the next thing that I would, you know, point out is, yes, I think uh, sometimes exercises are a good way. And, you know, we've done some exercises for some technical roles. There's different debates. Do you do sort of do whiteboarding exercises, even though we live in a virtual world? Do you do take-home exercises? Do you do some combination? Do you pair programming? Um, that's very uh, individual specific and skill need specific. So we have some roles where, you know, one of our technical interviews is the most important and then some roles where it's the least important. So, um, so, you know, one, one thing that I will say is a vast majority of our senior talent, early, uh, technical talent came from our network, whether that's, you know, effectively your first degree connections, or maybe your second degree connections. Um, it is very hard to find third degree connections that are willing to take a huge professional gamble uh, on you, even with you know, a great product, a great vision, some funding, um, that doesn't even solve it either. I think you really need to you know, kind of look for uh, you know, Michael Jordan at UNC or Chris Mullen at St. John's or Patrick Ewing on Georgetown, people that maybe would be overlooked as professionals insofar as maybe they, they're inexperienced. I think that's the wrong dimension. That is kind of what my picture implied, but I actually think um, a better dimension, 
of of thinking about these trade-offs is you know maybe you have someone and, and now this is actually very common but you know gitlab is a company that was always uh you know remote first remote right. always um and maybe you know pre-pandemic um this could be a huge hiring advantage because most companies were in person so you need to figure out what is your you know advantage or angle or differentiation in the market now often your friends you can convince them by being um you know really uh excited and having something great to offer them but beyond that you're gonna have a number of the challenges that even the best startups face today in competing with um basically very deep pockets of the larger uh enterprises no love that very very useful uh, which leads quite nicely here, and I know this is always one of those questions I've, I've heard it before from from Roka, and it's always kind of difficult to to answer, right? Like how long is a piece of string? Where Roka here asks, um, how do you decide on how to way to investors and co-founders? Um, any, <laughs> I guess, frameworks that you use, or any? Maybe not necessarily framework, more a a on how you know you would consider going about it um so uh you know i'm gonna do a cop-out answer and say it very much depends i will tell you that my personal experience uh, among co-founders is to do a, a a pretty fair and even and just uh split they're in it uh to win it with you and i think that that's kind of um that you know, that's kind of a place to. It's, it's an easy place to start. There are sort of online calculators where you can talk about differences in experience or you know value props or things that you're bringing to the table. Um, when it comes to early employees, uh, there is existing data. So I, um, uh, you know, I actually, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that we graduated from Y Combinator. I'll put in a quick plug for this tool, Pave. Pave has a free offering that basically enables you to see, um, you know some data that tends to be a little bit sparse on what early stage startups give for compensation and equity. And you want to have like a startup philosophy, uh, which is, you know, do we want to land in the, you know, at the top of salary and the top of equity? Do we want to land in the middle of salary and the 75th percentile of equity? Do we want to land in the bottom 10% of each of those? You want to have a startup philosophy and then remain consistent to it. I think fairness becomes um, very challenging. It's always hard to adjust um, because often this, the stock options are, are cheapest and most bountiful when uh, the, the company is early. So you want to kind of get that right. And, you know, there are online resources, actually, like the, the CEO there embarrassingly used to be in uh, the intern program at Yammer that I used to run. Um, and now he's an incredibly, you know, built an incredible product um, with incredible traction that has a ton of really valuable data. So um, happy to put in a plug uh, for Pave. Brilliant. Love that. Uh, Diana here, quick ask. You mentioned your contact details earlier on. Uh, what are Peter's contact information? Um, I think you mentioned it verbally. Sure. I did add it to the chat, but I'm I'm Pete at MozartData.com, and I'm I'm you know I'm happy to I I hosted office hours as part of Stop Startup Grind where I mostly talk to folks just about sort of data problems. Um, I'm a data geek by training, um, and I love thinking through these sort of data challenges, especially at, at, at the startup stage. And then, of course, you know I work with a really incredibly talented team that helps. Uh, folks get started on their data infrastructure journeys and uh, a really awesome tool that you can self-serve on uh, Mozart Data. Brilliant. Time for just probably two quick ones uh, as we're on the half hour mark. Abdul here asks, any advice for successful pre-sales? He knows of a YC startup that gave a discount for a time period. He created a, the urgency. Any other tactic or, dare I say, even maybe strategy that you would reckon? Sure. Um, so one, I am a huge advocate, especially for B2B companies of showing value first and then charging. So whether that's in a trial, Mozart offers a, a free 14 day trial, whether that's offering um, startups, uh, 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 you know, credits, and obviously the, the bigger companies are, are known for, for doing this. And, you know, obviously some of the sponsors of, uh, of Startup Grind uh, do this. Um, Mozart Data itself uh, does offer some startup credits. So 
So uh, reach out to me um, if that's something of interest. But in general, I am a huge advocate of proving your value and then selling. So it's so much easier to sell something where the person has, you know, this is not like a restaurant where I'm like, all right, eat the food and then tell me how much you liked it. But I do think that sort of demonstrating value has become so mainstream in B2B. Sometimes it's a, a, the extreme version, which is open source, but sometimes it's things like trials and uh, free credits. Excellent. Uh, and this one's very interesting. Of course, we're now um, heading into what they call a post-pandemic environment. Uh, Steve here asks, which of your startup lessons and tips changed due to the impact of COVID-19? Um, you know, how they changed. So anything that has, I guess, either lesson wise changed or of course, you know, work from home, remote working, but anything else that you've seen that has ultimately kind of changed specifically in the startup space that founders should be aware of. Yeah. Okay. So there's, there's two, one is the super obvious one, which is, I do believe in sort of, um, talent that is more distributed. So I always imagine sort of working with, my, you know, next to my friends in an office in the Bay area. And now today we're a massively distributed company. Um, so that's, that's a very obvious one that COVID's changed the perspective on. The one that I think is the most important that people don't talk about is that COVID has led to this incredible fluctuation in, um, funding and valuations and multiples and interest rates uh, environment. So, you know, we're now sort of experiencing the downturn of that. But um, I was sort of, you know, when we were raising sort of our seed round, we were experiencing sort of the upturn as, as sort of uh, liquidity got pumped into the market. But what you'll see as a function of the pandemic and, you know, the waves of the pandemic and all of the challenges of the pandemic, the economic challenge of the pandemic is that, again, it's sort of like Paul Graham's picture, which is, it's not sort of an up into the line, uh, up into the right line. It's in fact so much more of like a, like a sine curve with all sorts of you know, uh, you know, crazy directions. And I think the, the number one thing is cash management, economics, trade-offs, and that's actually why I chose, this is a great question to end on, it's why I chose this as the title for this conversation, um, I think become extra important in an environment, and you know, Doug Leone talked about this yesterday uh you know at the on the main stage but it become extra important in an environment that becomes a lot more uncertain and and covid is certainly um one of the drivers not just from like a physical perspective but also um from the economics so you have to again double down into making smart trade-offs fish what a fantastic way to end thank you so much for your insights uh to everyone please do look out for offer i mean um uh fish mentioned about the credits in there there'll be an off nature look out for that and of course head on over to their website if you want to give their 14 um chance data is powerful we all know that and it allows us to make informed decisions and certainly as the founders is that's an important thing but of course hopefully the insights that fish shared here about some of the trade-offs it's a smart trade-offs you need to make it that we're useful thank you all so much. Enjoy the rest of the last few sessions and we'll catch you all soon. Take care.